Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm a compliance evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 397 of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, I have a real treat for you because I have Erica Salmon Byrne. She is the Executive Vice President and Executive Director of Business Leadership Ethics Leadership Alliance at Ethisphere. We are here today to talk about the 2018 World's Most Ethical Companies and the report issued by Ethisphere around this. It is a great uh, report. It details uh, many of the uh, key uh, findings of Ethisphere who have been doing this report for nearly 15 years now. They've uh, developed a body of evidence that is, is really second to none in the compliance space around what constitutes the ever-evolving best practices compliance program. We talked to uh, Erica about the uh, criteria used, uh, what is the most significant part in my mind, which is the three-year ethics premium, and how having a more ethical company will make you more profitable at the end of the day. It's a fascinating exploration. Eric has a great uh, spokesperson for Ethisphere and a good friend in the compliance community. I know you will enjoy it. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I am back for another episode, and you're in for a real treat today because uh, you're going to hear from uh, one of my favorite people in compliance. I've known her probably the entire time uh, I've been in compliance. She's done great work in a variety of different organizations. Of course, I'm talking about Erica Salmon Byrne, and she is the EVP and Executive Director of Business Ethics Leadership Alliance at Ethisphere. And she is here to visit with us today about truly one of my favorite topics each year and throughout the year in ethics and compliance, and that is Ethisphere's World's Most Ethical company awards and honorees. So Erica, with with that uh, tongue twisting and long winded introduction, welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Well, Tom, thank you so much for having me on. It's it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Erica, the reason uh, I wanted to do this podcast and indeed why I get so excited about the WME awards is I first became aware of these uh, last decade and I can't remember if it was uh, 07 or 08. Uh, but I went to uh, an award, and one of the things that struck me was a slide by the presenter, which showed that companies who were WME honorees outperformed the S&P average uh, over a number of years. And that has stuck with me literally since that time. And one of the uh, uh, there's lots of great things about WME, but one of the things is you guys have been doing this for qu- quite some time and really have developed a body of data, of information, and other incredibly useful uh, uh, tidbits for the compliance practitioner. So if I could just start off with uh, how long has Ethosphere Ethos- awarded the WME? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. And, and and the performance piece you're referring to there is what we call our ethics premium. And we've been awarding the WME. This will be our 13th year um, that FSF has has done this uh, done this process. And you know, it's 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 very gratifying um, to be a part of something that helps build what I call the business case around ethics and compliance. You know, it's it's very challenging for compliance officers to prove a negative, right? You go home at the end of every day, nothing bad happened, that's a good day. And, and that's, a, that's a challenging environment to operate in. So anything that we can do to demonstrate to companies that doing business the right way, thinking about a broad stakeholder group, engaging with purpose, all of those things help from a financial perspective. That really helps the compliance officer build a business case that they are not just an insurance policy. They really are something that is returning value to the business. So I was wondering if you might be able to take the curtain back a little bit uh, and explain how uh, how a company would be evaluated for the WME, at least how it went into the 2018 process. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've been looking at the same broad categories of company performance, and this has been a distillation of uh, our thinking, Ethosphere's thinking over the course of the last decade. Uh, We have a lot of help 
from people who are on the Ethics Quotient Methodology Committee, um, individuals in academia, individuals in, in, in practice, people who have, you know, recently retired from compliance roles, um, have all provided us feedback on the the things that we evaluate and the things that we look at. And they really go into, you know, what I what I consider to be the sauce that makes that correlation, that ethics premium correlation that I referenced. It's a it's it's not any one thing, really. It's a compilation of different things that create the environment in which employees are comfortable bringing their whole selves to work and really doing their best work. So we look at five main categories. And this underpins not just the world's most ethical companies process, but really all of Ethisphere's thinking in all the work that we do, whether, you know, you look at some of the agendas from some of our summits or our conferences, if you think about what we talk about at our roundtables, all of these things are, are influenced by these same major five categories. Obviously, your ethics and compliance program is a big piece of it. Um, it's probably, uh, I would say, the bulk of the questions in the ethics quotient survey, which is the beginning of the evaluation process. Those are, are largely tied to regulatory guidance. Um, Tom, since you know, you've known us for as long as, as you have, you know that that survey has changed over the years. And you know, 10 years ago, it was very, very focused on what the sentencing guidelines had to say. Um, those questions have evolved as other regulators have gotten engaged uh, in looking at what makes a good compliance program. So um, the survey is now influenced by uh, things that we see in ISO 37001. It's influenced by things that we see in the Clean Companies Act. It's influenced by things that we've seen come out of the UK. Um, it's influenced by some of the things that have come out of the DOJ here, some of the comments the Fed has made about you know different things that they're looking at. Um, as they think about the financial services sector. So all of those things kind of go into the mix um, and come out the other side as a survey instrument. And uh, the ethics and compliance program is, is one of the big pieces of that. We also look very, very hard at governance. Um, and really when we're thinking about governance, what we're focused on there is primarily how do you make sure that your board uh, is engaged in its oversight responsibilities, whether you're public or private, and there is a difference, you know, d depending on your ownership structure in terms of how the survey itself works. But whether you're public or private, the responsibility of the board is to make sure that they are effectively engaged in oversight and helping the company mitigate, it, mitigate its risks in the interest of all of its various stakeholders, whether it be shareholders or, um, you know, some of the other, uh, the other stakeholders that, that are interested in the performance of a given organization. Um, and so we look very hard at governance. Uh, how are you onboarding new directors? Uh, how many direct, uh, how are you turning your board over? So, you know, do you have term limits? Are you, um, are you, uh, do you have mandatory retirement age? Do you uh, do regular evaluations of your directors? Uh, how many directors have been on your board for more than 15 years, right? There's a lot of research out there showing that the, the influx of fresh blood into the board is a component of, of robust board performance. So we look at governance, that's 15% of the score. Uh, we look at how you engage with your communities. So, um, you know, how are you thinking about the communities that you impact? How are you thinking about your employees? How are you thinking about your various stakeholders? Are you building value in your supply chain? So, you know, we all know that third party risk is a significant area of exposure for a lot of organizations, but many companies are now starting to respond to that by saying, okay, you know what? We're not just going to try to mitigate risk with contract provisions, right, which, which end up with us litigating after the reputational harm. We're actually going to try to make sure that we choose the right partners for our business. We're going to try to make sure that we're mitigating risk in the supply chain by building capacity. So we ask questions about, you know, are you providing materials to help your third parties train their employees? Um, you know, do you, do you screen third parties for ethics and compliance related programs? Um, things along those lines. We look at culture. Now, this is an area that we've been looking at more and more over the course of the last uh, couple of years. Um, we're actually doing uh, separately outside of the WME process. Uh, Ethisphere does a lot of work helping companies measure their culture. It's probably my favorite topic um, to talk about outside of the ethics premium. Uh, just looking at, you know, helping companies understand as they think about mitigating people-created risk, how do we... Um, know that our employees understand where to find the behaviors that are expected of them to that. Can they find their co the code? Can they understand what it says? Is the training any good? But also, are they comfortable raising their hand? And who do they go to when they do that? Uh, and, and giving companies the data to be able to measure where those various spots are happening across the organization is another key piece that we look at. How are you measuring your culture? How are you communicating around your culture? How are you preparing managers to robustly uh, advance your culture? All of those things uh, go into the go into the mix. 
And then the last, of course, is leadership and reputation. So um, how are you how are you advancing the business uh, from a leadership perspective? What are you doing to um, to to adhere to different global standards? And what are you doing to monitor and look at uh, your reputation and improve it? You know, sort of with all of your various stakeholder groups. Long answer to a short question, Tom. Sorry about that. No, it was a great answer uh, because it really leads into uh, one of the areas I really wanted to explore uh, with you on this podcast, which is that I really see WME as literally setting a standard benchmark for companies in the areas of ethics and compliance. Part of it Mm -hmm. is companies that win the awards. Part of it is actually going through the process, and we'll talk about that in, in a separate process but uh, do you find that uh, it's really uh, that the the process, both the companies go through the process that Ethospheres goes through, and the companies that do achieve this really set a benchmark standard for for public corporations literally across the world? That re- that's really our goal, Tom. You know, it's, it's what we're trying to do is to identify those leading practices by companies and propagate them across the globe. So whether it is through the world's most ethical companies process, I have a number of companies who come up to me and say, the most valuable thing I do every year is just download the survey and read it. Because I know if you guys are highlighting something on the survey, it's something I ought to think about. They don't even go through the process. They just read the questions. Um, and, and, you know, and then they kind of identify where they're going to take their program from there. And, and, you know, that, that's gratifying to me. But also, if I look at our, our, our membership group, our Bella community, um, the Business Ethics Leadership Alliance, we take a lot of the, the information that goes into building that survey. Um, a lot of that is coming out of conversations with those companies to say, you know, we are, um, we're doing short form communications in the form of iPhone videos. We're stopping managers in the hall and just having them talk about something for, you know, 40 seconds that matters to them. And then we're using that as part of an ongoing communication campaign. So figuring out what are those things, what are those things that compliance officers are doing that's really resonating with employees around the globe? And how do we make as many people aware of that as possible? Um, one of, you know, our, our longstanding Bella members is fond of saying there's no competition in compliance. And I, I really love that because it, it, it encapsulates the way that I think about the effort that we have here, which is let's take something that somebody is doing really, really well in pharma, right? Highly regulated space, um, lots of, you know, issues over the years that lead to larger budgets from a compliance perspective. And, and this company has spent the time and spent the resources to figure out how to do X really well. Let's port that to manufacturing so that the compliance officer in manufacturing that doesn't have those resources can stand on the shoulders of pharma and advance their program. Um, and, and that's really the idea is let's take good practices from all these different industries, all these different countries, all these different regions. Let's figure out what everybody's doing really well. And let's port that as, as broadly as possible across the globe, um, make everybody aware of it. And then all of those programs collectively get better. Erica, right up front on the, uh, WME, uh, 2018, uh, dedicated portion of the website, it's got the three-year ethics premium. And uh, yep. as I mentioned in my introductory r- remarks, that that excited me nearly 10 years ago, and it still excites me now. I was wondering if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, what is the three-year ethics premium and, and how do you see this going forward? Yeah, so so we've been doing the the ethics premium tracking um, for about a decade now, uh, Tom, as, as you mentioned, and and what it is is it's it's our effort to and granted it's a rough financial measure, right? Um, I want to get that right out front because I always get people who say it's a correlation, you know, it's a it's a correlation. You don't have causation and all those kinds of things, and 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 we acknowledge all of that, right? Um, what what we have been able to demonstrate though is year over year in spite of various variations in the stock markets, the, com- the publicly traded companies, which is, of course, only a chunk of the WME list, but the publicly traded companies on the list routinely outperform the biggest global benchmarks. So whether it's you know, something like the S&P 500, which we've used in the past, um, we've also used the MSCI Global Index in the past, depending on the mix of companies that are on the list at any given point, we try to find the best, closest comparison 
and then we we track the stock performance and and it has varied you know some some years it's been as little as one percent some years it's been you know some years we've seen some closer to four or six um all of those various component pieces end up um showing though whether it's a small outperformance or a larger outperformance um those companies outperform and 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 i i get i get asked almost every time i talk about the premium to give my thoughts on what that causation component is uh because it is i mean i'm 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 very transparent about the fact what we see here is a correlation right there's a correlation between companies that do well financially and companies that are on our list um there's a correlation incidentally between companies that do well financially and companies that are very diverse as we see in some of the work that that um the UN uh, uh, initiatives on, on, uh, race and gender diversity have shown, you know, that financial performance component as well. Um, I, and I, I think it's a couple of different things. I think companies that wind up on our list are companies with good, strong ethics compliance programs. They're companies with good governance practices. They're companies that give back to their communities and care about their employees. They're companies that, um, have strong cultures. And so what I think the causation underpinning all of it is, is some combination of lower turnover, right? Um, and we all know that hiring is expensive and hiring the wrong person is even more expensive. So if you can uh, hold on to people and help them do their best work, you're going to be a uh, better positioned in the long term. So if you have a culture where people feel like their opinions matter and they can raise their hand if they have a concern and they can participate in the growth of the company, they're likely to stick around. So I think that's one component of it. I think you see companies that are able to engage in R&D and M&A activity because they're not paying giant fines and fees to lawyers, right? You know, Tom, you and I know well, when you run into a regulatory issue or, you know, an FCPA violation or something along those lines, um, what you end up with is you end up paying the fine, but the fine is like one tiny, tiny, tiny slice of the overall impact of that exercise. You've got the fine plus the fees to the lawyers, plus the fees to the forensic accountants, plus the hit on the stock price when you just closed the investigation in the first place, plus the productivity loss because all of your people were totally distracted by what was going on. And all of those pieces are tremendously expensive for an organization. So if you avoid that, well, just think, what can you do with those resources that your, you know, competitor is spending on that, that FCPA investigation? So, um, so it's, I think it's a combination of all of those different pieces. You've got dedicated em- employees that feel good about going to work there, that can raise their hand when they have a concern, that can raise their hand when they have an idea, right? Cause it's not, you know, one of the things that I always encourage compliance officers to think about is, a speak up culture is not just a speak up culture for issues, for compliance and ethics issues, right? A speak up culture is a speak up culture for compliance and ethics issues, for quality concerns, for challenges with a client, for new product ideas, for process changes. If I'm comfortable raising my hand and speaking my mind, that applies well beyond the ethics and compliance program. And so I think, you know, the, the causation underpinning that correlation is some mix of all of those different components that allow those companies to outperform their competitors. So one of the, uh, I did want to ask, were there any common themes that uh, you or your team saw in this year's, the 2018 WME uh, honorees? Yeah. And, and, and Tom, this is one thing I definitely want to highlight for any of your mm-hmm. listeners who are not aware of um, this particular work that we do every year uh, following the announcement of the list. Um, so sometime in March, usually, uh, we release a report. And that report is our insights from the data, uh, from the process that we went through, different trends and themes and things along those lines. And we usually pick three or four things, big themes out of what we saw in the data. Um, and that report is, is open and available to the public. You can go ahead and, and, and download it from our website. And it is one of my favorite pieces of work that we do every year because it's, it's really our opportunity to say, hey, here's what we see in the data. I think the one that I'm going to highlight for today's purposes, Tom, is one of the ones that I've been talking to companies about a lot. And that is how are companies encouraging employees to speak up and what are they doing to prepare their managers to hear that information? So, um, one of the things that we see, for example, a lot in the, um, in the, the data is companies that are looking more and more closely at how they empower their managers. And this makes sense, right? You know, if we look at 
at who I'm most comfortable raising a concern with, the, the likelihood is that I'm going to raise that concern with my manager, right? That's the person I go to with a question about work. That's going to be the person I go to with a question about gifts and entertainment. And what we see when we look at our culture data is we see a, a pretty strong correlation between uh, managers that are prepared that get training, they, you know, they have resources, they understand the role they play in the program, those managers are much more likely to have employees come to them and then to have those employees be happy with how that process went. And so companies are looking very hard at how am I training my managers? Am I giving them the right resources? Am I talking to them about what retaliation looks like from the employee's perspective? And then how am I following up with people on the backside of that investigation. So this is, this is a really, I think, a really interesting thing that we've seen over the course of the last couple of years is companies trying to be more and more transparent about the investigation process. We've done a really good job about, of making that box as black as possible. Um, you know, something goes into that box, mysterious stuff happens in that box, something comes out the backside of that box, that if I'm the person who had a concern about my colleague, I have no idea what happened. And so companies are trying to make that box at least gray instead of black, if not tra- if not in- even more transparent. So we see, for example, in the 2018 data, we see companies talking about the fact that they monitor uh, individuals for indicia of retaliation. They look for increased patterns of sick days. They look for changes in their performance evaluations. They look for, they check to make sure that somebody who's being targeted for an involuntary uh, reduction in force is not somebody that has raised a concern. And if they are, that that, that targeting is still appropriate in light of the concern that they raised. Um, we see companies having uh, a, a portion of their investigation process being to follow up with the known, with the reporter, if known, and any material witnesses in that investigation to say, thank you so much. The information you gave us is a gift. That's how we're thinking about it. We can't necessarily tell you what happened, but we looked into your issue and, 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 you know, and, and, and it's been resolved so that at least they know the investigation is closed. Um, we see companies looking at the extent to which they're able to share their investigation data. This is something we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, but it's been increasing. You know, it used to be that, that the only people who knew about the hotline statistics and close rates and how long it took to close an investigation was the board of directors or the committee, the oversight committee of the board, the management team, and the people in the compliance function. Well, now companies are saying, okay, how can we share that more broadly? How can we share the stories we learned more broadly? How can we make people understand that these things really do happen here and we take them seriously? Um, and so that sort of transparency campaign to try to address uh, feelings of organizational justice disparities, all of those things are, are things that we've seen in the data over the course of the last couple of years, and I think it's a really encouraging trend. So one thing I've always been curious, uh, Erica, uh, they there have been companies on the list that uh, perhaps uh, are under an investigation. There have been companies on the list that have gone through certainly FCPA, but even other types of enforcement actions. There have been uh, reputational issues that have cropped up uh, over the last 13 years that have shown up for companies on the list. Um, can you explain why a company who might have gone through such an issue uh could still be at least eligible for a WME? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, we have a five-year look back. Um, So we, you know, from a reputational perspective, we look back five years from any given review period. Um, We don't really uh, start that look back until an issue has been resolved. So if there are outstanding allegations, um, we wait for the actual resolution of those allegations. So we wait for the resolution of the investigation. We wait for, you know, the resolution of the litigation, whatever the case may be. Um, and then that, uh, we balance that against all of the other components that go into the evaluation process. So it's not necessarily a situation um, where something is going to um automatically exclude you from the process. Um, you know, some of, as you know well, Tom, some of the very best and most strong uh, compliance cultures are built on the ashes of a challenge, right? Um, that that can be, you know, where you kind of get the funding to advance your program in the first place, and then it's a question of whether you maintain it. So, um, so we, you know, we, we wait for that resolution. Um, we look at what else the company has done and what might potentially counterbalance that resolution. And then the review team makes a recommendation uh, as to whether or not that company belongs on the list. So, um, you know, if you've, if you've had a challenge, if you've had an issue, uh, the, the question we always ask is, is, you know, how have you addressed it? How have you resolved it? What have you done about it? Um, 
if you become a recidivist, right, there's a repeat issue that becomes a bigger concern to us. Um, and it's part of the reason you see the variation in the list year over year. Uh, you know, companies moving on, companies moving off. Um, a lot of that is, is a result of, of, you know, people who, um, who have had an issue and, and, you know, that, that issue has been enough to not outweigh the, uh, the, the strains of the rest of their program. So in another podcast, uh, I'm going to visit with Doug Allen a little bit about the uh, WME application process, but I was wondering mm-hmm. if you might give a f- few words from your perspective on the um, internal evaluation process. How do you go about it? Uh, who, who looks at these things? Can you maybe uh, pull the curtain back just a little bit? Um, so I, I, I am not part of that review process. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 I'm not the best person um, to, you know, necessarily fully pull the curtain back. I can give you my perspective. I am a part of the pro- of the uh, team here that does the EQ uh, evaluation process every year because I spend so much time talking to companies. I have a lot of thoughts about how to update the survey. So I'm going to uh, tweak your question a little bit, Tom, and 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 talk about how we update the survey every year because I can speak to that from personal experience. Um, right. So so the the EQ process, you know, we're making notes. All, all year round about, you know, what it is that we want to add um, to the survey, you know, what is it that is no longer a leading practice. So uh, 2019 was actually a, a year where we made a lot of changes to the survey. The survey had been pretty steady um, for about three, three, three or four years before that. We'd made some minor tweaks to change the wording of a question when somebody didn't necessarily understand exactly what we were targeted at. If we get that feedback from companies, you know, five or six or seven or eight companies say, what do you mean by X? We look at it and we say, oh, well, you know, maybe we weren't quite as clear as we could have been. So um, so we definitely change, uh, you know, we, we did those changes over the course of the last couple of years. Um, the, 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 bigger, um, the bigger changes, the big changes we made this year are things that we've been kind of talking about and percolating on for about 18 months. So um, we made changes across every category of the survey. Some of the survey sections got bigger changes than others. One of the biggest changes we made this year that I'm really excited about is in prior years, the the, the questions about your, your third-party practices, how are you advancing the value chain, um, they were kind of sprinkled throughout the survey. So we had questions about your supplier code of conduct in the written standards section of the survey, and then we had questions about your due diligence process in the monitoring and auditing section of the survey. And so this year what we decided to do is let's take all the value chain questions and we're going to put them in one place um, so that you can send it to the people on your team who deal with third-party risks and ask them to answer these questions for you. Because, you know, we know that very often when you go through the survey process, you're pulling information in from all these different functions across the business. So um, we, you know, we've, we've been making notes over the course of the last 18 months, as I mentioned, looking at things that we wanted to add to the survey to measure, looking at things that 100% of companies said they were doing. If 100% of companies are doing something, it's not, you know, we're not pushing the envelope any longer. It's, you know, sort of a standard practice. So some of those questions got dropped um, from the survey, uh, you know, and, and we're just going to assume that that everybody has a code of conduct for it. You know, that's not in there. Uh, that's still in there. But, you know, but, but, um, I'm trying to think of another better example of something that everybody was doing. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that everybody was, um, uh, providing, uh, communications to, uh, high risk individuals that interface with third parties. You know, 100% of companies that have a, a, a government and FCPA-related risk were, were training their people on, on that issue. And so that, you know, that's, that's not really a question that we're asking any longer. So we looked at that. We talked to the methodology committee. Um, if anybody's curious about who's on the methodology committee, we're very public about that. It's on the website. Um, and we got feedback from all of these different individuals that provided us ideas of ways that we could really change the survey. We added questions about whether or not you as the head of the ethics and compliance program are meeting an executive session with your oversight committee. We added questions about root cause. So are you doing root cause analysis on your investigations? Are you doing them on all your investigations or just some of your investigations? So all of these different, you know, sort of new ideas are embedded in the survey now. And I'm super excited about what we're going to see as companies start to respond to it. And, you know, just stay tuned for next year's data insights report, because I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a blockbuster. Erica, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but I was wondering if any of our listeners wanted uh, more information on the 2018 WME honorees, um, where could they go? 
So uh, definitely follow us on all of our various social media outlets. Um, like you, Tom, we're, we're active on Twitter. So you can find me at, at E. Sam and Burn. You can find Ethosphere at, at Ethosphere. Um, you can uh, find the data insights report that I've referenced for the 2018 company uh, uh, grouping at, on our website. Um, go ahead and download it. Uh, Tom, I think you would agree there's you know, some interesting data points in the report itself, um, which we're excited about. And then uh, you can always uh, uh, also follow us on LinkedIn. We have a, a company LinkedIn page, and we're very active posting what we're up to, some of our different research pieces that we're uh, coming out with. There was a root cause uh, analysis piece of research that we came out with earlier this year that was a lot of fun. So um, if any of you are, are not currently following the thought leadership that we're doing, those are a couple of ways for you guys to get engaged. And I would just certainly add that to any listener who does not follow uh, Ethosphere needs to uh, do so after they finish listening to this podcast. Erica, as always, it's been probably uh, much more fun for me than uh, than for you, but I want to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure, Tom. I look forward to this every year. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I know I certainly enjoyed visiting with Erica today. We're going to link to the um, uh, Ethosphere report that she referenced throughout this podcast in the show notes. I hope you'll check it out. There's a ton of information in there. If you've never uh, rated this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you would leave a rating on iTunes. It would help get the word out about the oldest podcast in compliance. This is Tom Fox. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I hope you'll join me again next week for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.